Well, good evening. We made it. It's Christmas Eve. You're here. You've arrived. Christmas is tomorrow. Uh, 2021 is finally at an end, and we have now a whole new year of opportunities ahead of us. So welcome. And I know why you're here, right? You wanted to sing some Christmas carols. You wanted to look at some pretty trees, and hopefully you are expecting me to tell you the Christmas story. Well, tonight, we're going to look at one aspect of the Christmas story, and that will be the story of the shepherds. I think the presence of the shepherds has to be one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story. They don't say much, uh, they don't do much, but it was important for God that they be there for the birth. And that's saying a lot. You know, when the time came to tell Zechariah, about the birth of his son, John the Baptist, God sends one angel. When the time came to tell Mary about the birth of Jesus, God sent one angel. But when the time comes to announce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, God sends a whole sky of angels. Is that how you would have done it if you were God? I mean, if you were planning to launch a political campaign, or you're going to start a new business, or you're going to put out a brand new product line, who would you invite to the release party? It would probably be the people who have the most money, or the people who have the most influence or power. And that's sure not the shepherds. I bet if you ask people in the first century who lived back then, who would you invite to the baby shower of the Messiah? The list would start maybe with the high priests, go down to the religious leaders, the scholars. Some people might even say King Herod. I mean, he was king at the time, right? But he was a cruel king. I think if he ever did make it onto the list, it would have been temporary. His name would have been scratched off pretty quickly. But who gets an invitation? Shepherds. Shepherds who have been sleeping outside. Tell me something. Have you ever gone camping and had to sleep outside? Gone camping for a couple days, been camping for a week. In my adult life, whenever my family have camped out on campgrounds, we've been close to public showers and you know, a good hot shower always feels good. But I remember some campouts as a kid, especially uh, going camping with scouts or maybe with the youth group, there weren't any showers at all. And boy, did it feel good to get home and wash all the dirt and the smell of camp smoke off of you. And that was just after a couple of days. That was even sleeping in a tent or sleeping in a cabin. We don't know how long the shepherds had been camping out or if they even had a tent at all. And I'm sure that it, their camp tent didn't have a nice floor like our tents have today. Here's what we find in the Bible in the book of Luke. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. I save the story of the shepherds for tonight because it is a beautiful chapter in the Christmas story. And I know you don't need me to go over it and over it because we all know the Christmas story. And we hear it every year, and not just at church. How many of us hear the Christmas story told on TV and radio in all of our favorite Christmas carols? 
In your home right now, you might even have a little nativity scene. And in that nativity scene, you probably have a little sheep and a little shepherd. So my question this evening is, why does everyone in the Christmas story get a visit from only one angel and the shepherds get a heavenly host? Because the shepherds aren't royalty. In fact, their entire contribution to the Christmas story is only 13 verses. And then we never really hear from them again. God's heavenly messengers show up to a group of dirty, outcast shepherds who are all camping outside on the edge of town. Why? And then after the shepherds see the Holy Family, the Bible says, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They, they rush off, and they tell everyone about it. Why? I mean, what's so special about what they saw? Just a newborn baby? We've all seen newborns. Babies are born every day. And yet the Bible says there's amazement. The Bible says the shepherds tell everyone. Well, let's start at the beginning. First, in verse 8, the Bible says, Nearby shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. Raise your hand if that sounds exciting. (laughs) Babysitting sheep. Okay, let's pretend this is you. All right, this is you. It's nighttime, it's cold, it's lonely, and you're outside in the elements and you're with hundreds of sheep. Where would you rather be? Anywhere, right? I would rather be anywhere else, exactly. Well, these shepherds, they're no different than you. They're real people just like you because the Christmas story is real. Christmas story is a true story and they are just like you. They don't wanna be here. I'm sure they would rather be home with their families and sleeping in their own beds. Shepherds are day laborers, and they typically come from poor communities. They're average, blue-collar, minimum wage, streetwise people. In fact, in some communities, to be a shepherd was almost the lowest position that you could have. In fact, many rabbis uh, forbade shepherds to even testify in court, and some were homeless. They were vagabonds. But the situation here is just a little different. These shepherds are all outsourced employees of the temple. All of these lambs that we are watching over tonight, they are all property of the Jewish temple. The story takes place in Bethlehem. So these are all Bethlehem sheep. And Bethlehem sheep are bred and raised for only one purpose. Sacrifice. Every day of the year, two sheep are sacrificed. That's 730 lambs a year. A lamb is sacrificed at the beginning and at the end of every single day. But in addition to that, thousands more lambs are needed every year by Jewish families for holidays like Passover. And most people don't have the means to sacrifice one of their own lambs or the ability to even bring a lamb with them from out of town. So it made much more sense for them to buy any needed lambs from the temple. But the main reason these shepherds are here with this sheep tonight is because it is lambing season. Normally, you can leave a sheep in a pen, in a gate, and maybe only have a single shepherd that's standing guard. But right now, the lambs are all giving birth. And so the shepherds are out in the fields, and they're watching over their sheep to ensure that there's no complications in the birth. Verse 9 says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. I think if an angel visited us today and said that the king of the world was going to be born and then laid into a cattle trough, we'd be a little offended. Doesn't seem very dignified, does it? Our author of this story is Luke. Luke is a doctor. He's a medical examiner. And he's commenting on something that back then was normal. 
Newborn babies during that time were often bound very tightly and wrapped in swaddling clothes, and that was done so that the baby's limbs would grow and develop straight. But this birth announcement is to shepherds. It's not to a group of doctors. It's not even to a group of midwives. So the question is, would these shepherds think it was strange to find a baby wrapped up tight and placed in a manger? Actually, no. For them, this is something they would have seen every day. Remember, it's lambing season. These shepherds are currently sheep midwives. And so when a newborn baby lamb is born, the first thing a shepherd would do is wrap it tight in a cloth and then place it in a manger. Really? Why? Well, so that that baby doesn't roll around and get hurt or get lost in the crowd. Wrapping them tight and placing them in a box is a good way to keep them controlled and organized. And it totally sounds like how a man would do things, right? Baby born, wrap it tight, put in box. <laughs> the angel says in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. An angel from heaven tells you that you can expect to find a baby not in lavish wealth or riches or in comfort or born in some distant mansion somewhere. No, the announcement from God's messenger that's declared from the skies is your king is born, your redeemer is born. This is a black tie, red carpet affair. And the birth announcement is on raised gold font and the ink is made from real gold leaf, right? This birth announcement wasn't any of that. It says, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. Notice that there is a sign, and the sign that God sends is for them. It wasn't a sign for nobility. It wasn't a sign for the upper crust. The sign of Jesus' birth was for shepherds. The angel says they're going to find a baby human just like they would find a baby lamb. Jesus was a king. He came without a proper bed, without robes, without chariots, without processionals. He came without a crown. But that doesn't lower Jesus. And it doesn't devalue him. Rather, it connects him. It makes him relevant. It gives him rapport with his people. Because Jesus wasn't going to be a king on a throne. He wasn't going to be a king behind a curtain. In fact, when Jesus begins his ministry, he starts by saying, I have come to bring good news to the poor. That was going to be his mission. To bring light and hope into the dark corners that the world forgot. And we see that mission beginning here and now even though he is only hours old. Why shepherds? Well, these shepherds represent every forgotten person and every untouchable outcast. The birth of the king is for all the world. The Bible says in verse 16, they went with haste, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. The shepherds arrive, what do they see? A tiny human baby. Right? Well, I don't know, because if that was true and they only saw a tiny human baby, that's a pretty normal thing. But the Bible says they don't respond normally. The Bible says when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. How ironic is this? Shepherds who are not allowed to bear witness in court, they are chosen to be God's first witnesses. Why? What's so special about shepherds? Why were they invited? Why do a host of angels bring them the good news? What can they see that we can't? Well, if you want a diamond appraised, you would go to a jeweler. If you want good wine tested, you would go to a sommelier. 
And in the Christmas story, God is sending something special into the world, so he sends experts to witness it. And years later, when Jesus begins his own ministry, his cousin John sees him coming down the road, and his cousin exclaims, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And so, the meaning of the shepherds is this. If you want someone to witness the birth of a lamb, you send shepherds. The heavenly host came to shepherds because they were experts in their field. Literally. The sign was for them. You know, we often think that Mary and Joseph had no choice but to place Jesus in a manger. They were forced, right, by urgency and makeshift. But that's not the case. Jesus was placed in a manger because that was his destiny. And it was to remind shepherds of newborn baby lambs. Because then these shepherds, they run off and they tell everyone about the Lamb of God. Their announcement was a king for his people, living among his people. I think a lot of times in church and throughout the year, you'll hear Jesus described as the Lamb of God. But what does that mean? Did God only send these shepherds because Jesus was placed in a manger or born during lambing season? Or is there something else? I'm sure that you can imagine that if you're responsible for hundreds or even thousands of sheep and they're all giving birth, a lot of them are not gonna make it. Babies die during birth, so do the mothers. It's part of life. If you have a healthy mom and a healthy lamb, then you have no issues. But what happens to an orphan lamb? Who raises it? Every year at this time, the shepherds lose between 30 to 40% of their sheep. And that's due to birthing complications. And what you end up with then is you have orphan sheep, and then you have mother ewes that have milk, but they don't have a child. And they won't, by nature, nurse an orphan. Mother ewes are notorious for not accepting orphan lambs. Well, you can't just put another baby with her and then convince her to raise it as her own. So what would a trained shepherd do? Well, they would trick the mother into believing that the orphan is hers, and then she'll adopt it and nurse it. So the shepherds have two choices. The quick, fast way is they would smear the orphan baby in the placenta of the mother. That's a quick, cheap way. Sometimes it works, but the surefire way is to get their hands a little dirty. The surefire way is to take the orphan lamb and to cover it in the blood of the baby. Then the mother would smell the baby and recognize it as her own and then nurse it. Are we on the same page? Through the gift of blood of the lamb that died, the living lamb is recognized and restored to the fold and nourished and saved. Why is Jesus the Lamb of God? Because we are the orphans. We are born into this world, we are alone, we are separated, and the only way that God would ever come near was that if his own son gave his life and covered us in his blood. This Christmas, we need to remember that we have been washed in the blood of Jesus and he is the Lamb of God. Now I know typically we don't think about Jesus' death at Christmas. During this season, it's usually all about the baby, but the joy of the baby isn't just in the birth. It's also in his death. When John calls his cousin the Lamb of God, who takes away sin, that's a pretty morbid thing to say of a family member. In my home, we have a cross ornament on the Christmas tree. And you probably do too. But the cross is more than a symbol of who Jesus is. It's also a reminder of his destiny. Christmas is the day the lamb was born. God made his entrance on earth in the least of expected places, from the least expected people in the least expected way. 
And rather than be a king on a throne, he came as a sacrifice who served. And he did this so that the worst and the best, the richest and the poorest, the first and the last would find him. There is a weird little story at the end of the book of John. Jesus has risen from the dead and he's having a little fish picnic with his disciples. And he pulls Peter aside and he asks him if he loves him. Jesus asks him three times. And each time he's asked, uh, Peter gets a little annoyed and he says, yes, you know I love you. Have you ever wondered why Jesus asks Peter the same question three times? Well, remember when I said the shepherds were watching over temple sheep? That flock was there so that people could buy a sacrifice. But the truth is, neither the temple nor God want a sacrifice that you just pay for with money. It's not much of a sacrifice if it only costs you money. So to get around this, every sacrificial lamb was required to be a pet in the family for at least four days. So the day after the final Sabbath Passover, shepherds from Bethlehem, they would drive thousands of lambs into Jerusalem where they were taken into Jewish homes and then treated as pets. And then before the lamb was sacrificed, the priest would ask the family, do you love this lamb? Only lambs that were loved were worthy. Only lambs that were loved were accepted. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And by doing so, he was asking Peter to accept him as his sacrificial lamb. He was asking Peter to acknowledge him as savior. And since that moment, each follower has been asked that ever since. It's not difficult to receive Jesus. And much of being a Christian is just admitting we love Jesus and then continuing to follow Jesus as we live. Bible reading, church attendance, discipleship, obedience, all of that is church language. It's just another way of saying we love Jesus and we are grateful for what he's done for us. Because we've all been lost. We've all been abandoned. At one time or another, we've all felt like the orphan right? I've felt like a forgotten person. I've felt like an untouchable outcast. And then at one time or another in our lives, Jesus whispers the question into our ear. Do you love me? And we have to answer. What does that mean for us today? Well, I believe that our response should be the same as the shepherds in the Christmas story. In the Christmas story, we read, once the shepherds saw and understood that Jesus was the Lamb of God, they left the Holy Family and they went door to door and they told everyone that Jesus was born. Which means those shepherds became the first evangelists, right? They became the first missionaries. And if we really believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God, then that should change the way we live. And we should bring others to him. Listen, every single one of us, we have a role to play. God has called every single one of us to tell the gospel. And I think so often many of us believe, well, you know, you just, you just hire a pastor to do that. But God calls his people to be different. The book of Exodus says that Israel will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God essentially says, I am your king and you are the kingdom. Matthew Francis Paris is a British political writer. He's a broadcaster. He's formerly a conservative member of parliament. He's been a journalist, a radio host, a TV personality. He's been an activist in the LGBTQ community. He's also not a Christian. But in preparation for tonight, I came across an article that Mr. Paris wrote many years ago. And this is what he said. The New Testament offers a picture of God who does not sound at all vague. He has sent his son to earth. He has distinct plans for each of us personally. 
and can communicate directly with us. We are capable of forming a direct relationship individually with Him, and we are commanded to try. We are told that this can be done only through His Son, and we are offered the prospect of eternal life, an afterlife in happy, blissful, or glorious circumstances, if we but live this life in a certain manner. Friends, if I believe that, or even a tenth of that, I would drop my job, sell my house, throw away all my possessions, leave my acquaintances, and set out into the world, burning with desire to know more, and, when I had found more, to act upon it and tell others. Far from being puzzled that the Mormons and Adventists should knock on the door, I am unable to understand how anyone who believed that which is written in the Bible could choose to spend their waking hours in any other endeavor. Finding the Lamb of God, being part of that story, changed the lives of everyone involved in that story. And as that child grew into a man, that man also became our shepherd. A shepherd who said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Before we go tonight, might I offer one piece of advice. Follow. There is no resolution that is more important to make. There is only one. Follow. If you believe the Lamb of God was born on Christmas Day and that he grew into a man and he was alone, the only way to salvation, and that same man was both shepherd who healed and protected, and he was also lamb who was sacrificed for our sins, that that God-man was flesh and he dwelt among us, the next year there is only one resolution follow. Follow. Set out into the world burning with a desire to know more, and when you have found more, act and tell others. That is what it means to be his disciple, and that is what it means to carry Christmas every day in your heart. Let's pray together. Lord, this day is here. It is Christmas Eve, and we are all excited to rush home, to spend time with family, to get a good warm night's sleep, and then to wake up to a house filled with joy and laughter, to hear children running about, to see presents opened, to stuff our bellies with food. Christmas is a wonderful time. Lord, it's also a day to remember you, your son, who was the perfect gift. He was a gift for all the world, a gift given in humility, a gift given in love, and ultimately a gift given in sacrifice. Lord, it is your son's gift of his life, his gift of his blood, that is really the reason we can say Merry Christmas. Yes, he taught, he lived, he loved, he held, he healed, he nourished. But Merry Christmas is the celebration that a Redeemer was given, that a Savior was given, that the long-awaited Messiah was given this precious gift, his precious life, the Lamb of God, come to take away the sins of the world. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for the first gift, the first gift of Christmas. We pray across the the world, that every church right now is packed, that there are no seats left in any churches anywhere, that the gospel is told, 
that hearts are broken, that knees are bent, and that each one resolves to follow, to live more, and to listen more, and to follow more, this wonderful shepherd. Amen. I have nothing left to say, but have a blessed tomorrow. Have a Merry Christmas. It has been so wonderful being the shepherd here in Montgomery and having this church. We love you. We want you here every single week. We want you part of this community or any community that you can be a part of. Please go attend your local church. Become a member of your local church. Serve your local church. Serve. Follow. Love. I love you guys. We'll see you next year.